Shalom and welcome back to Chain Languages. Two weeks ago I made a video on three forgotten Germanic languages and you guys seem to love it, so today I have a part two. First however, we are going to have a quick word from this video's sponsor. Which would be me. I didn't actually sponsor this video, I am joking. And it has something to do with this. So stay tuned at the end of the video, but for now, we're going to go on to our first language of today. Okay, so the first language we're going to talk about today is one that lots of people in the comments told me I should have talked about. It's one I'd not actually heard of before. It's called Vimasuris. Now, it doesn't have a flag, but it does have this creepy looking coat of arms, and it appears on things such as this welcome sign in the place it's spoken, Wilamowice, which is a city in Poland. And here's a map of where it is. It's within the Lower Silesia Voivodeship. However, this is not the Silesian language which we've talked about here before on the channel. We'll see exactly what it is in just a second. So it's also known as a Wilamowian. In fact, it has a few different names. Wilamowicz, Wilamowian, Wilamowicean, and the actual endonym, uh, which is pronounced Vimsuelish, or something like that, on the IPA. Bear in mind that the W represents a V, as it uses both a mixture of German and Polish orthography. Despite being spoken in this one town in Poland, it is a Germanic language, however. It's part of the Schlesisch Wilmau, East Central German sort of um, sub branch. Uh, it's of course West Germanic, just like German, Dutch, and English, which is part of the Greater Germanic branch, which is obviously one of the major branches of the Indo European language family. In 2017, it was cited to have 20 native speakers. However, in 2006, 70 overall speakers were documented on Ethnologue. It's kind of difficult to know how many people speak it, but there has been a bit of a revitalization recently. The revitalization efforts are currently taking place and have started so, uh, to do so since the 1980s. The Hobbit, for example, was translated into uh, Wilamowian and it was performed at the Polish theatre in Warszawa. That was in 2016. And the University of Warszawa has this, the Wymysiorysi Akademia, Akademia Wilamowiciana. Excuse my pronunciation in both of those languages, but it has been recognised that it's as a huge threat of dying. So revitalisation efforts are happening, and they seem to be doing okay at the moment. However, it's still likely to keep on dying if people don't really get involved in the preservation of this language. So let's take a look at the language itself. We have the phonology here, which is very interesting for a Germanic language. Note that we have these, the soft versions, which occur in Polish, but not in most Germanic languages. It's hard to say whether this is an influence of Polish onto Wilamowian, or whether it developed these on its own. Personally, I think it has something to do with Polish contact, as uh, pretty much all speakers of the Masoris are bilingual Polish Wilamowian speakers. Also, we have this situation going on too, which is also another thing that's characteristic of Slavic languages. The consonants also display us with a, an interesting situation. We have things like that Slavic I there, which don't usually occur in Germanic languages. However, we have some very characteristically German I and I, so you can see that it definitely is still retaining some of those features, but it may have picked some up from Polish. Again, it's hard to say whether they did, or whether they developed these on their own. Personally, my theory is that it's been heavily influenced by Polish. We also have the orthography of the script, um, or sorry, the orthography of the language, which uses a very Polish-inspired orthography. However, we'll see that you've got the O with the umlaut on it, which doesn't occur in Polish. It occurs in German, however, and it represents the E sound that uh, German has. So, it's been adapted for use in Poland, but still retains the necessary letters to represent Germanic sounds like E. And as you can see, it's got 
diphthongs and triphthongs as well. Finally, let's look at a sample of Villamovian. This is the Our Father prayer, and I'm not going to read it, but as you can see, one might make the assumption upon looking at it first that it is Polish, but you look closer and you see words like Fote, you know, which is cognate with father, uh, and in German it'd be Vata. And you can see just many of the words that are cognates, and you'll realize it seems like a distant form of German. What's interesting to note is that Villamovian is not descended from the Silesian dialect of German, rather it's been there for much, much, much longer, appearing as early as the 1200s. And the Schlesius Villamau uh, branch that it's from is different to the branch of Silesian German. However, that's all I have to say about Vimosaurus, Villamovian, Villamovitian, whatever you want to call it. And we're going to move on to our second language today, which sadly is not a living language anymore. The beautiful backdrop here is the Orkney Islands, north of Scotland, and owned by the United Kingdom. However, I'm not here to talk about Scots, or perhaps Scottish English, or Gaelic, which was never spoken there anyway, but rather an extinct Norse language that was spoken in the Shet Shetland and Orkney Islands, as well as some northern parts of Scotland. This language was called Norn. It even has a flag, although, to be fair, it's the same flag as the Orkney and Shetland Islands. And here's a map of the 15th century of the situation. Blue represents Gaelic, yellow represents Scots, and orange represents Norn. So, Norn. As far as we know, that's what it was called. And it appears to have just started off as a dialect of Old Norse. Uh, Southern Old Norse, to be exact, but it did split off and become its own language. As you can see, it is derived from Old Norse. Walter Sutherland was the last speaker of it, and he died in 1850, so it lived on for quite a long time. However, it had a very long decline before then. The Ninorn project, however, was begun in 2006. Now, it bears resemblance to Ninorsk, which means New Norse. So Ninorn is New Norn. And Shetland and Orkney Islands both had dialects of their own. They've tried to reconstruct these dialects with the Ninorn project, but mainly they're trying to work on a standard, which I believe is based on what was the Shetland dialect. Sadly, not many texts were written in Norn, so it's not fully known, and the the project, the Norn project, is not as much a revival as much as it is a reconstruction to try and reconstruct the language. However, we do know that there's some Norn influence in Scots, and to a lesser extent, Scottish English. These are mainly in the form of place names, but even some small everyday words apparently have come from Norn, although some of them are contested. Here's the website that I was talking about for the New Norse project. It looks very dated, but it has got plenty of resources on there for the different dialects, for the phonetics, the grammar, all that sort of stuff. And sadly, if you click on the idea, uh, on the phonetics part, they have this weird complicated format. You have to really scroll down and read it. However, I did find a simplified version on Omniglot, which also includes the script. So you can see there the IPA symbols used for their phonology. And here we are as well, um, to include the vowels. And it has, once again, the consonants. And thanks to Omniglot for that. Finally, let's look at sample text. We have this, which I believe is the um, our Father Prayer, again. Thankfully, that's quite an available text. I can't always find the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but I can usually find Our Father, because the worldwide spread of Christianity has translated the Bible into hundreds of languages. And you can see some words look exactly the same, like forgive, uh, which is interesting. And you can see cognates like gav, gavos dach wudach locht brau, uh, which I will think means uh, give us today our daily bread. Um, it reminds me of Norwegian, vaguely, but what's interesting is it doesn't use any diacritics at all. 
so it looks like it's written with a much more English or perhaps Scots orthography. Whether it was always written like this, I cannot be sure. Again, the texts are not very available, and this text was specifically said to be in Ninorsk. Uh, Ninon, sorry. So that's it for Norn, and we're going to move on to the final language of the day, which is another one that people really wanted me to talk about. So as I said, many people wanted me to talk about this language, and the language in question is Gutnish, which has this cool flag, which is the flag of Gotland, and here's a map of where Gotland is in Sweden. Now, Gutnish is also sometimes called Gotinska in Swedish. The languages in Gutnish itself, however, are somewhere between Gutiska or Gutamal. Uh, it depends on the speaker or the context. There are between 2,000 to 5,000 speakers today, uh, but that's really a shadow of its former self. It's not to be confused with Gotlandic, which is the Swedish dialect spoken in Gotland. And on the island of Gotland itself, there appears to be two languages, Gotlandic Swedish and Gutnish. However, the majority of the inhabitants of Gotland do not speak Gutnish. It is being revitalized, however, by the Gutnish language guild, who claims that they have 1,500 users on Facebook. The University of Gotland also runs a course in Gutnish, and between the years 1989 to 2011, there was a Gutnish language radio show that would regularly get 20,000 listeners. However, similar to Alf Dalian, it is at risk due to the poor recognition and the replacement by the Stockholm Standard of Swedish, also Gotlandic Swedish. If we were to take a look at Gotland itself, we can see that, that there are two dialects of Gutnish. Now, Gutnish is not spoken here. This is an island that's north of Gotland that it cannot fit on this map. However, there's this island here called Foru, and on Foru, they have a completely different dialect called Faroimal. Uh, the rest of Gotland speaks standard Gutnish, which is called Lauma. Anyway, if we were to take a look at the phonology of Gutnish, we will see that it does differ from Swedish. So the main differing um, consonant phonemes here are the retroflex consonants, which if you watched my video on the three language revival movements, which is my last video, you'll know what these are, as the Bangala language has retroflex consonants. It doesn't have the same ones that Gutnish has, but as we can see, Gutnish has them, Swedish does not. They also have an interesting situation going on with their R's here. They have voiced and voiceless R's. Voiceless R's are a feature that pop up in a few Scandinavian languages, including Icelandic. They're not easy to make, but they make a distinction between R and R. They also lack a few consonants that standard Swedish has. Uh, so. It's interesting that there is quite a bit of difference here. Their vowel phonology, on the other hand, has another story. First of all, there is no distinction between i and e. It's just i and u, like a longer one. They have the umlaut sound, u. They have a distinction between o and o. At the end, as you can see, the back, open, mid, close, mid vowels. And they don't lack the characteristically Swedish sounding U uh sound. It just doesn't exist. Here is an important point to mention that Gutnish is derived from Old Gutnish, which was a language spoken by Scandinavian peoples who often get called Vikings. They went to uh, Gotland, but they actually spread the language further into the Baltics as well. However, it died off there a long time ago. Old Gutnish is a completely different sub-branch of the Scandinavian languages to what Swedish is in, which is crazy. So it is supposedly quite different. That being said, it's still in the same language family and it's still a Northwest Germanic language, rather North Germanic language, so it does contain many similarities. Let's look at this text, for example. Now, I don't know a single word of Swedish. But I can tell that it does look very Swedish-like. There are some things that are different. For example, as I mentioned, it doesn't have the U uh sound, which is represented with a, an O with an umlaut in Swedish. You won't see that anywhere on this text. It looks a bit more like Old Norse to me with the spelling, 
but in the day I can still tell that it's very Swedish influenced. But I would like to hear from Swedish speakers once again, just like I did in my last Germanic languages video. Tell me, how well can you understand this? Is it easier or is it harder than Elfdalian as well? I would like to hear that. But for now, we're going to move on to the final part of this video. And that final part is my so-called sponsor, which is, again, me. It's just a joke. I'm not sponsoring this video in any way. But I would like to mention that if you saw that clip at the start, you'll see that I reached 3,000 subscribers today. Now, today, which is the day I'm recording this, is Wednesday the 30th of November. You'll be seeing this at least by Friday. So I made this community post about three hours ago. I don't know if you've seen it because my community posts don't always get to everyone. But you could pause the video and read it, or you can just listen to my summary. Uh, first of all, I'm sticking to weekly videos now. This has been the case for the last two months, but I'm making that actually official. So every Friday at, at least six o'clock, if not just a little bit later, maybe an hour or two, depending on if I'm behind on a video. But every Friday at six o'clock, there will be a video. That's here to stay. Uh, second, since my channel's got to a big size now, YouTube has actually stopped sending me notifications for individual comments. So it's not as easy as it was before to respond to everybody. That being said, I will always go through a video every now and then when I've got some free time and check and respond and do all that sort of stuff. So um, don't worry, I'll get back to you. It just might take me a little while. The third thing was I'm going to make some big changes. I want the videos to improve in quality. Hopefully this video is better quality to other videos that I've made. I've got lots of things to work on to get better at, including my own presenting skills, my editing skills, animations, also just doing more research into the topics so I have more to speak about. So hopefully you'll notice a, an increase in the quality of these videos. Also there's been a bit of a rerun, as you can see. Not at the time that I'm making this video, but by Friday I do intend on putting the rerun there at the same time that I upload the video. The fourth point I made was that I'm now monetized. That happened earlier this month, and that's incredible. As I say in the post here, this is a huge achievement for me, and it means I'm finally doing the thing I love the most, and actually getting paid for it. Again, the thing I love the most, besides my fiance. Of course. <laughs> I don't think she'd like to hear that I prefer making videos, because that is not the case. But I don't want to seem like I'm a sellout. I don't want to seem like I'm doing this for money. I want to make sure that you learn something new, that your passion for languages grows, that you enjoy the content. So I don't normally beg for you to subscribe and like the video in my videos because I don't think that's going to make people want to do it anymore. Uh, I just think it's annoying. Uh, but yeah, I'm not doing this for the money now either. I'm doing it because I really enjoy doing it. I just want to let you know that I really enjoy making the videos. It's going well for me. I've got this motivation to make videos again now. And uh, I'm really glad that I am doing that. Finally, I'd like to thank you all. So I've had this channel for a year and a half. Well, a bit more than that now. I started it in March 2021. And it took me a long time to see any sort of success. Uh, I finally feel like it's paying off now. And yeah, I, can, I can't really believe I got here. The fact that I've gone from having just over 1,000 at the beginning of this year to getting 2,000 just earlier this month to now having 3,000 in less than a month. It shows that the growth of this channel has effectively just gone in a straight line upwards since last month. Uh, I'm feeling the effects of success. I'm very, very thankful for that. People are starting to see my videos. People are actually commenting and we're having full and interesting discussions about languages in there. And I really enjoy making all this content. So yeah, thank you to everyone who subscribed. If you're not subscribed, again, I don't like asking for it, but please do because the majority of the people who see my videos are not subscribed. It's a little bit disheartening to see, so please do consider it, but no pressure. And yeah, thank you for all the support, 
and thank you for getting me here to 3000. Hopefully I'll be making another celebration video like this in a few moments time. So um, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And yeah, thank you. Once again, thank you. Sorry if that rant seemed a bit long. I just wanted to say what was on my head. It wasn't scripted or anything. And yeah, I really do thank you guys for where I am now. I really hope you enjoyed this video. Personally, I found the languages in this video more interesting to talk about than I did in the last one. Um, and let me know what you'd like to see next time. There are plenty more to talk about. People have been begging me to talk about Frisian. So that's probably going to come up in the next video. So yeah. Once again, I hope you enjoyed, please do consider subscribing, and I will see you next week. Yalla.